Gormaga Brendan, August John Paul, August Gormaga Galer is Fleshore, August Honor Vordom, Betel Sotten Yov, August Bavalum of Wichus, Coronel Don Laurelin, August Emma Clancy. I'm very grateful to you all for making the effort tonight. Our climate is temporarily behaving itself, uh, which means that we are finally experiencing proper November weather. That does make it more difficult, of course, to venture out, and I'm very grateful to you all for making the effort to listen to some reflections tonight. I'm also conscious that the library services throughout the country and the local initiatives have made an enormous contribution to the decade of commemorations. It's very difficult, as John Paul has highlighted, to do justice to all that needs to be commemorated or should be commemorated but it is important that the dynamic is apparent at local level and that has been a feature uh, of the last nine or ten years that local communities, local authorities, local library services take control um, of the historical inquiry, uh, try to put some kind of framework on it, encourage young people uh, to get involved in it and it's as it should be. That decade that we have been looking at was one that was full of local impulses and regional dynamics. There is no one size fits all. And it is, I think, important to acknowledge the effort that has gone on and continues to go on uh, at library level and, and local level and the sense of engagement and ownership that people have of their own history. Because this decade of commemorations should not be about historians, professional historians, telling you what you should be commemorating. What we are trying to do as historians is facilitate inquiry and curiosity. We are trying to fashion new frameworks of interpretation based on the evidence that we are lucky to have access to. And there are many historians who have been engaged in outreach, none more so than Eamon Phoenix, who sadly is being buried tomorrow in Belfast. Eamon Phoenix died earlier this week. He was an exemplar uh, of public history and by extension of public service. He's a great loss to communities, to the profession, and I want to dedicate tonight's lecture to the memory of Eamon Phoenix. I'm not here to offer you a polished history of the Civil War in all its dimensions. I'm not here to give you a sophisticated PowerPoint. I'm here to offer you reflections. A century on, what is involved in researching different aspects of the Civil War, the mindsets and the impulses associated with the Civil War, the currents running through uh, Ireland of 100 years ago or so, those who were impacted by that civil war, the scars that it left, the mental scars, the physical scars, the material scars. We do have new questions to ask as historians and to try and answer. We do have new evidence that offers us an opportunity to devise new frameworks of interpretation, but they are by their nature provisional. They are not definitive. None of us are holders or guardians of the truth when it comes to what happened in Ireland 100 years ago. And I'm conscious that when I was a student of history, there were fairly trenchant interpretations of the Civil War on the part of historians and politicians uh, and people generally. I also remember when I began work in UCD just over a quarter of a century ago, it coincided with the 75th anniversary of the Civil War, and there were very well honed and trenchant interpretations of the Civil War on the occasion of the 75th anniversary. I remember Tom Garvin, for example, producing a book called 1922, The Birth of Irish Democracy, which posited the idea that the Civil War was a battle between Democrats on the one side and dictators on the other, that it was a battle between those who fought to secure the survival of the nascent infant state and those who saw the Republic as a transcendental moral entity, as he wrote. A faith, a spiritual reality almost, of the Republic. 
There was no doubt about what side of the debate that Tom Garvin was on. These Democrats, these state builders, had to ensure the survival of the state and had to kill people in order for that state to survive. There are other labels associated with the Civil War historically that suggest extremes and polarities. Brother against brother. Green against green. And when I look at some of the archival material associated with Eamon de Valera during the Civil War, I think of another polarity that he highlighted when he wrote to Mary McSweeney, the redoubtable Cork Republican, in September 1922. He told her that reason rather than faith had been his master. He couldn't identify with those, like Mary, who he wrote were on the plane of faith and unreason. It's a reminder that even on the anti-treaty side, even on the Republican side, there were shades of opinion. De Valera felt that he couldn't make common cause with those who were depicted as the diehards of the anti-treaty side. The writer George Russell A.E. shortly after the Civil War suggested that both sides came to embrace what he called the one-dimensional one mind. They were busy hammering that into shape. But the truth was, there were various contours, there were various shades, there were various shadows over the course of 1921 to 1923, including the British shadow. Winston Churchill, as Secretary of State for the Colonies, wrote to Michael Collins as Chairman of the Provisional Government in 1922 in April. And he suggested in relation to the occupation of the Four Courts that the Provisional Government must assert itself or perish and be replaced by some other form of control. There's no doubt what he meant, that Britain could re-enter the fray, that there could be a resumption of the Anglo-Irish War. And this was one of the shadows that was hanging over Ireland in 1922, and it needs to be acknowledged. There were also those who were engaged in personal ego trips, those who were imbued with a sense of personal mission and personal ambition that were perhaps put that before principle. But let us also remember the personal cost that the divisions of 1922 meant in practice. Michael Wren, who was a pro-treaty IRA officer, recorded in his diary before the outbreak of the Civil War, I stand to lose 50% of my friendships. It was simple and stark when it came to the reality of what this meant for interpersonal relationships, for friendships, for communities. But Michael Wren also recorded that he was growing weary of those who adopt an air and tone of moral superiority to all lesser men. And it's a reminder of how the narratives were developing at that time. Those who felt that they had to cling to the ideas that they had been immersed in during the formation of their political consciousness. Whether that was through cultural nationalism or political nationalism or intense military action or a combination of all of those. And no doubt narratives were developing during and towards the end of the Civil War about how to frame this particular event, even before the embers of the Civil War had faded. Kevin O'Higgins, for example, as the hard man of the 1920s government, as the Minister for Justice in 1924, was invited to the Oxford Union. And he gave a well-known address in 1924 in which he framed this image of the state builders. Eight young men, he described, standing in City Hall amidst the ruins of one administration with the foundations of another not yet built and wild men screaming through the keyhole. We can see what he was doing, fashioning a narrative that would strip the other side of their humanity, of their rationality, of trying to polarize the divisions of 1922 in that way. There were others, including the, Sean, the, the, the playwright Sean O'Casey, who came through their own writings to ponder on the issue of personal ambition and personal idealism, and what the Civil War meant for the inhabitants of Dublin city tenements, for example. Sean O'Casey, at a later stage in the 1950s, looked back 
to his 1920s trilogy of plays. And he was trying to reflect on the meaning of the shadow of a gunman. And he suggested that civil war should only be fought for great causes. We need to be per careful, he said, of personal idealism. Good intentioned, well-meaning as it may be, its flame in a few hearts may not give rise to new life and hope for the many, but dwindle into ghastly funeral pyres. And he was also writing about an Ireland of 1926 where 800,000 people were living in overcrowded living conditions according to the census of that year. The point he was making was what had changed for those he described as the inanimate patsies of the tenement buildings. And that too is something that we need to ponder in relation to the revolutionary mindset. What changed and what did not change during this period? How else were the debates framed during that period? Could Ireland's plight be addressed in 1921 and 1922 through real politique? Consider the contribution made by Frank Gallagher to the treaty debates at the end of 1921. He insisted that Ireland was not land, Ireland was not people, Ireland was spirit. Ireland was the dead and the things the dead would have done. How do you argue with the dead? How do you argue with the sacrifices? By concentrating on the living. Now is for the living, according to Michael Collins and his pro-treaty colleagues. We have to think about what we can build arising out of the historic compromise that has been made. There were others on the pro-treaty side, particularly after the death of Michael Collins, who insisted in relation to the policy of executions that there is no other way. 81 people were executed over the course of the Civil War. For W.T. Cosgrave, that was, in his own words, about taking the responsibility of government. This is about defending democracy to the hilt. But if 1922 was really about the birth of democracy, why was there such an abject failure to find a political solution, an alternative to violence? Irish democracy predated the treaty. So according to Bill Kassan, who has written on the politics of the Civil War, the vista of a heroic elite forcing democratic values down the throat of a recalcitrant society should not be taken at face value. But this was just another manifestation of the battle to control the narrative and the labeling of 1922 to 1923. There were those who insisted on the pro-treaty side that it wasn't worthy of the label a civil war because that gave a legitimacy to the other side that they didn't deserve. We also have to acknowledge the global picture in 1922. The violence in Ireland was small scale compared to what was going on internationally. Ireland was not a part of the culture of defeat after the end of the First World War that prompted what historians refer to as ultra-violence in other parts of Europe at that time. Consider what was going on, for example, in Latvia or Estonia or indeed Finland during that period. What Winston Churchill famously dismissed as the wars of the pygmies between 1918 and 1923. The after-effects of the First World War. Deep ethnic strife, sectarian divisions, battles over boundaries and borders. Four million died in those so-called wars of the pygmies between 1918 and 1923. 1,500 people died roughly in Ireland's civil war. Consider the recent work of Anthony Beaver in relation to the Russian Revolution. What he describes as the extremes of sadism. 36,000 people died during the Finnish civil war, a population of similar size and population to Ireland. Many of them were starved to death. And Anthony Beaver's work, of course, highlights the hacking, the gouging, the boiling, the scalping, the freezing to death. We were not in that zone of violence in 1922 and 1923. There's no doubt there were barbarities. There were atrocities. There were savage incidents, particularly towards the end of the Civil War. And yet some historians of global revolution would argue that there were certain restraining impulses at work in Ireland too during that period. 
perhaps the shared Catholic faith of both sides of the Civil War divide at a time when 94% of the population of Southern Ireland was Catholic. And yet, that too is not a satisfactory analysis. There's little moral consistency throughout this period. Does the intimacy of killing in the Irish Civil War in such a small country, does the mindsets that come with that intimacy we also have to be conscious of the intense religiosity of that generation and how it impacted on their civil war mindset. Mention was made earlier on of Erskine Childers. God's plan was part of his execution as far as he was concerned. We have to think of the last prayers of those who were about to be executed. Peter Cassidy is not a household name. James Fisher is not a household name. These were the young working class dubs who were the first victims of the policy of executions. There was also during the Civil War the resort to hunger strikes. And consider the pledge that the hunger strikers made. For what I am about to suffer, I offer to the glory of God and the freedom of Ireland. God came first when it came to the hunger strikes of the Republicans. Ernie O'Malley, who stayed on hunger strike for 41 days, insisted in his correspondence with Molly Childers, the widow of Erskine, the country has not as yet had sufficient sacrifice. It hasn't had sufficient suffering. There's not enough spirituality, he insisted, in our movement. Ireland, he insisted, needed to get back its real soul. And there's an emotional charge, of course, to this kind of correspondence. We have to understand it. We have to bring the Civil War back to those who fought it between 1922 and 1923. In the words of the historian Richard Evans, it is not our duty to lecture the people of the past on how they should or could have done better. It's our job to try and understand them, to try and understand their mindsets, to try and understand their sometimes tortured positions. The late David Fitzpatrick wrote a biography of Harry Boland, of course, who was one of the high profile victims of the early days of the Civil War. He concluded that Harry Boland was at once a dictator, an elitist, a populist, and a democrat. He was all those things, but his sincerity, he insisted, could not be impugned. We have to allow the space for that generation to exist as they existed in 1922 and 1923, with all of their shades and all of their contradictions, all of their fanaticism, as it might be seen, and all of their sincerity. There's no doubt that there was a degree of contempt for what we would call public opinion. Many soldiers had a contempt for politicians. Why wouldn't they have had? Consider the words of the Chief of Staff of the IRA during the Civil War, Liam Lynch. He insisted that politicians did not need to take precedence over soldiers because the army had to hew the way to freedom for politicians to follow. There was a dismissiveness of what the people might think on the part of some. But there were also minds that swayed during the Civil War. The young Frank O'Connor, in turns during the Civil War, who went on, of course, to become such a renowned writer, was initially trenchant. But then he lamented those who he insisted had suggested the Republic was still in existence and would remain so despite what its citizens might think. Too many mystical abstractions, he wrote, reduces life to a tedious morality. I rarely thought, I felt. And it's important for us to understand what it was to feel. There were plenty who had a foot in both camps or no camp. Augusta Gregory, the famous playwright, recorded in her diary that she was tired of different sections of one's own mind, swinging from one side, tilting from one side to the other. There were also those who were neutral. The research of the historian Jimmy Wren has underlined 
the views of the GPO garrison in 1916. There were 572 members of the GPO garrison during the 1916 rising. 41% of those 572 opted out of the Civil War or were neutral during the Civil War. The Sinn Féin TD, Liam de Rochte, kept a diary throughout the Civil War period. And he recorded that for all of those who were actively engaged, there were many who were only passively interested. There were always, according to the historian David Fitzpatrick, cows to be milked, hay to be saved, and women to be ordered about. It's a reminder of the demands of ordinary life even during a period of civil war and extraordinary upheaval. And there were those who felt tortured by the choice that was on offer in late 1921. I got the title of my book, Between Two Hells, from a speech by Tipperary Sinn Féin TD, PJ Maloney, who had already lost a son during the War of Independence, who himself had spent 23 days on hunger strike. I'm no orator, he said, during the treaty debates. I'm no statesman. I'm looking for the path. I'm looking for guidance. But we are being faced now with a choice between two hells. I cannot, he said, vote myself in to empire. And that debate, of course, was playing out, being maneuvered into a position where you had to choose between two hells. And for the historian, local and national, there's the added difficulty of trying to describe a complicated, chaotic civil war. Michael Hopkinson, as the historian, did a fine job in his book, Green Against Green, in 1988. He was describing what he described as chaos, a civil war that had an ill-defined beginning, an ill-defined end, fighting that was erratic, that was confused, that was highly regionalized. The difficulty of describing its many forms, the regional differences between the War of Independence and the Civil War. Why was it, for example, in Wexford, that 50 people were killed in that county during the Civil War, but only 23 people were killed in Wexford during the War of Independence? Why was it easier for the Free State side to secure places like Cavan than it was in other counties? What about the land agitation and issues that were to the forefront in a county like Cavan? Two and a half thousand tenants who were still unpurchased tenants, the hunger for land, the Evicted Tenants Association, demanding justice, demanding that the land be restored to them, the rightful owners, the land that had been taken from their fathers and grandfathers, as the Cavan Evicted Tenants Associations described. The activities of the ITGWU in Ballyconnell in Cavan, in relation to the desire to break up the ranches. These concerns remained, of course, in various different counties. They affected the dynamics. So too did the policing challenge. The Civic Guard ensconced in Cavan Town in September 1922. It wasn't as easy, of course, in other towns. It depended so much on the regional dynamics. So we do have inconsistency. We do have regional impulses, regional differences. We do have a fracturing throughout 1922 and 1923. But chaos has many forms. And for many, the Civil War's afterlife was also fractured. It was cruel. It was disordered. And that's where historians can open up a new space 100 years on, particularly when it comes to the archive of the military service pension files, the material that has been released in tranches in recent years, detailing the applications made by the men and women who were veterans of this period, describing the circumstances in which they were living after the Civil War, what they had done during the Civil War. What does it reveal to us in relation to the mindsets of 22 and 23, but also the aftermath? What does it tell us about the status of women? Consider those who were labelled the Furies by P.S.O. Hegarty in his book, The Victory of Sinn Féin in 1924. He devoted a chapter to the anti-treaty Republican women. His views were also reflected in the diaries of Liam de Rochte that I mentioned a few moments ago, who recorded that these women were not normal human beings with normal human mentalities. 
They were monomaniacs, he insisted. They were a moral sore in the soul of Ireland. One of those anti-treaty Republican women, Sheila Humphreys, was later to recall that they were forgotten, that the tinted trappings of our fight were hanging like rags around us in the aftermath of the Civil War. Exactly 100 years ago, Mary McSweeney was on hunger strike, a hunger strike that lasted for 24 days, insisting that she was prepared to do what her brother Terence had done during the War of Independence. She was often sneered at and dismissed as an irrational extremist. In correspondence with her, Eamon de Valera, who I mentioned earlier on, had described the different level that she was at. But again, there was no doubt in her mind about the meaning of betrayal. She had spoken for two hours, 40 minutes against the treaty. The transcript, handwritten transcript of her treaty speech runs to over 160 pages. And think about the impact that hunger strikes had on both men and women. Three weeks on hunger strike did enormous damage physically, mentally, emotionally. Almost 600 women were incarcerated during the Civil War. 90 of them went on hunger strike. The Catholic bishops famously referred in their pastoral of October 1922 to the decent Irish boys who had degenerated so rapidly. So tragic, they didn't even refer to the degeneracy of the women. They were beyond comment. But they were dehumanized in many respects. In 1942, Nora Martin, who was a leading light in common demand during the War of Independence and Civil War, insisted that those overseeing the military service pension applications had no appreciation of what women had done during the Civil War. One woman, at least, she said, should be on that advisory board. Lawyers and civil servants, no matter how sympathetic, can never visualize the feelings of these women. What constituted active service for women during this period? How do you define fighting for Ireland in 1922 and 1923? Women were confined to the lowest grade of pension grades D and grades E because of their auxiliary status within the Republican movement. And yet many, of course, had put their lives on hold and had put their lives at great risk during this period. Joanna Cleary died in 1924 at the age of 26. She never recovered from her hunger strike as a common among member during the Civil War. She was from Ballymore, just outside Dingle. She was the breadwinner. She worked in a Cork asylum. There were nine dependent children living at home on the small farm in Dingle. That farm was described as a farm that consisted of the grass of two cows. And this is one of the great values of the archive of the military service pensions. The detailed overview you get of living conditions. The reports that were compiled by welfare officials and guards in the district in relation to the circumstances of those particular families. Living on the grass of two cows, four of the siblings had emigrated to the United States. Frank Aiken as Minister for Defence and Sean McEntee as Minister for Finance in the 1930s had to adjudicate on whether or not a £100 gratuity, a once-off payment, was sufficient to settle the case of Joanna Cleary and her family. When we consider those who were adjudicating on these particular circumstances, we have to remind ourselves of what a lottery 1922 to 1923 was. There were those who recovered. There were those who were able to forge very rewarding careers on the back of their civil war service, on the back of their revolutionary endeavours. There were others, however, who were left to deal with the despair that they could not conquer. Consider another woman, Mary Devins the widow of Seamus Devins, who was killed during the Civil War in very controversial circumstances with six others in Ben Bulban in Sligo. She killed herself in 1936. As is recorded in her pension application, she died as a result of poisoning by Lysol, which she deliberately drank while suffering from mental depression. 
Or what about Margaret Doherty from Foxford in County Mayo, who was, as is described, outraged by three men in succession? The euphemism for rape, for a gang rape. After that, it is recorded, she began to fade mentally and physically, never to recover again. Think of Seamus Devons and Mary Devons, the public veneration of Seamus, the sacrifices that he made, a row of houses named after him, a pipe band named after him, an annual dancing competition named after him. There's the public veneration and the private trauma that we are beginning to learn about. And it's an intergenerational trauma for understandable reasons. Class is also directly relevant to so many of these pension applications. Interestingly, class, historians have concluded, was not directly related to support for or rejection of the treaty, but it permeates the pension archives. The most glaring omission from the Doyle were unskilled workers. There were few references to class in the treaty debates. But when you begin to look at the experiences of individual families, you can see why and how it permeates this archive. Consider the situation of the Hales brothers, for example. Sean Hales as a TD, assassinated in December 1922. That, of course, was the event that was one of the most shocking of the Civil War, the idea of a serving politician being assassinated. What about his brother on the other side of the Civil War divide? Robert Hales in 1948, described as an individual who has but two teeth in his mouth, both affected with pyorrhea. He had rheumatism. He could not work. What good, he asks, is 28 pounds per annum at the present time when a man cannot earn his living? That 28 pounds referring to the pension that he was awarded. Or consider the five O'Neill brothers in West Cork, including Dennis O'Neill, who's reputed to have fired the shot that killed Michael Collins in August 1922. Collectively, the experience of the O'Neill brothers underlines the implications of being on the run, of death, of alcoholism, of disability, of emigration. Jeremiah O'Neill, one of the brothers, was described as a cripple with two sticks by the middle of the 1930s, awarded a grade E pension of £15 per annum. Or what about John O'Neill, another one of the brothers, dead at the age of 50? He recorded how from 1916 to 1923, he was never able to sleep in his own home. He described himself in 1933 as a complete wreck living with three children on 10 acres. And if I do a hand's turn, I have terrible vomiting of blood. I ask you in the name of honesty, fair play, and as far as charity's sake is concerned, to make sure my family do not starve. Frank Aiken had endured his own difficulties during the Civil War and found it very difficult to talk about. But he owned a very substantial dairy farm in Sandyford. Jerry Boland, another founder member of Fianna Fáil, got impatient with the pensions process. He ended up on a grade A pension of £300 per annum, a very substantial sum during that period. But he considered it, in his own words, an insult to be answering questions year in, year out, when it came to the reissuing of forms relating to the pension. We have to remind ourselves that those who are sometimes referred to as the austere Republican founding fathers were not always enduring great austerity when it came to their living conditions and when it comes to comparisons with those who were enduring austerity. Consider the plight of Daniel Shea, for example, who was one of the victims of the excesses of Paddy O'Daly of the Dublin Guards in Kerry in the spring of 1923. His family were awarded a gratuity, a once-off payment of £133. But Paddy O'Daly's portrait adorned the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin. He received a pension of £280 per annum. And those on the National Army side, the Free State side, who were treated appallingly too. Peter McCartney, for example, who was killed in the capture of Ernie O'Malley in November 1922. 
Peter McCartney's father reminded the pension overseers that they were from a poor farm in Leitrim. His father received £40 as a once-off payment for the loss of his son. He was still begging at the age of 86 for an increase in this payment without success. My son, he wrote simply, left his employment for the freedom of this state. Or consider the plight of those who were victims of Michael Kilroy and his anti-treaty IRA in Mayo. The death of Joe Ruddy in Newport in 1922. His father insisting that the £50 once-off payment awarded to him was not just an injustice to him, but was an insult to the dead. You also get some of the victims of the Nocnagoshal atrocity in Kerry in the spring of 1923, writing to the Pensions Board. The plight of the widow of Ed Stapleton, who was killed in Nocnagoshal. Julia Stapleton, his widow, endured further tragedy when their five-year-old son died. The Department of Finance insisted on recouping the £1.17 shillings that was overpaid for the month after the five-year-old had been killed. And we've numerous incidents, of course, of this bureaucratic cruelty. We also can look at the records and the files of those who were killed in the famous Ballyseedy atrocity in 1923, when nine Republican prisoners were tied to a mine that was detonated. Stephen Fuller miraculously survived that particular outrage. But looking at the files of those who were killed that day, you can again trace the geography, the economy, the culture of working class Kerry. Once again, it's the grass of three, four, perhaps if they are lucky, five cows. I mentioned Peter McCartney earlier on killed in the capture of Ernie O'Malley. Ernie O'Malley, of course, was also dealing with his own trauma and his own wounds. But he was also living with a pension of £258 per annum, a military service pension, and a disability pension of £120 per annum. And it was hard earned, there's no doubt about that. But you cannot help now focusing on the disparities, the disparities that arose out of the same events and how different individuals fared. Trauma is there throughout, what we today would call post-traumatic stress disorder. It wasn't labeled that in the 1930s and the 1940s. George Lennon, who lived to the age of 91, never really covered from 1922. He was a teenage IRA volunteer in Waterford at the fall of Waterford. He had a breakdown. His pension application contains over 10 changes of address. It's eventually decided that he is suffering from what's called traumatic neurosis, which appears to have been the direct result of his war service. According to his son, Ivan, he never referred to it as the Civil War. He called it the unmentionable. He found himself in America in the 1960s, practicing Zen Buddhism, still searching for tranquility, for some kind of inner peace. And that was one of the points, of course, that Ernie O'Malley made later in life in relation to the disillusionment. Britain, he insisted, was no longer his enemy. Each man finds his enemies from within. And these battles for status, for recognition, for material survival, reveal that raw intimacy, the long reach of trauma that is both internal and external. There were those two in the National Army that were seeking to return to work, to civilian life, after the demobilization that inevitably came in 1924, in 1925. The National Army was bloated beyond all that was necessary for this small free state, some 55,000. It was necessary to demobilize 37,000 of them. <coughs> An estimated 100 of those demobilized National Army soldiers were sleeping rough in the Phoenix Park by the middle of the 1920s. Eddie McAteer, one of the veterans of the National Army, wrote in 1926, suggesting some of us were willing to throw up our employment 
to join the free state. Now we were left without a penny to earn while others were lucky to get back to their previous employment. There was a sense of betrayal too on the part of those who were forced to drift back over the border. The sense of the civil war diverting the attention of the Republican movement away from the project of destabilizing the new Northern Ireland. Antrim volunteers describing their plight when they were deemed to be surplus to requirements, drifting back over the border to a very hostile regime. James Gallagher in Derry complained bitterly in subsequent decades about what he described as obstacles being put in our way when it came to pension applications from those who were still residing in Derry at that stage. It was dangerous to keep records in the new Northern Ireland for obvious reasons. This was seditious literature. So there's no about, doubt about the extent of that disillusionment. Our current president, Michael D. Higgins, has made the point in relation to his father that very few people would employ an ex-internee. His father, John, had to battle to get his pension reviewed. It took between 1934 and 1949 and on to the 1950s for this to be resolved. He wrote a poem about it, The Betrayal. It contains the lines that you, his father, had been moved to where those dying too slowly were sent, a poorhouse no longer known by that name. And there was a shame, and there was a humiliation. And there was inevitably perhaps a silence in relation to some of those experiences. The famous interview given by Sean Lamas towards the end of his life, in which he said terrible things were done by both sides I prefer not to talk about it, as his eyes welled up. His brother Noel was savagely mutilated in the Dublin mountains even after the Civil War had ended. And of course the suffering doesn't end in the spring of 1923. Consider the hunger strike, for example, of Andy O'Sullivan from Cavan, from Den Ball. Death after 40 days on hunger strike towards the end of 1923. There are 12,000 interned Republicans at the end of the Civil War who are not reconciled to the state. We need to open up those discussions, of course. We also need to acknowledge the scale of the emigration. In the part of the country that my grandparents are from, in West Kerry, there were 257 members of Common Common during the War of Independence and Civil War. 106 of those 257 had left West Kerry by the 1930s. 30% 30 overall of the West Kerry IRA had emigrated by the 1930s. And what about the legacy in relation to the Catholic Church? We understandably refer to a triumphant Catholic Church in the decades after the Civil War. But why? Partly because they were so shaken by the Civil War. They were feeling deeply insecure about the capacity of their congregations to wage war against each other. The volatility. It's no coincidence that from the 1920s we get this relentless focus on transgression, on doom, on gloom. The focus on the need to return to normality, the need to punish, the need to make invisible what is causing an embarrassment to Ireland's good name. It's partly a legacy of the Civil War. The inherent sinfulness of the Irish people is being continually underlined throughout the 1920s and beyond. That suggests a deeply insecure Catholic Church, which was determined to enter the particular vacuum that opens up as a result of the Civil War and flex its muscle. We also have a relentless centralization of political power, which is another product of the Civil War. We can talk, as James Dillon famously did in Fine Gael, about the codology of Civil War politics, given that there was so little that divided them in ideological terms. But paradoxically, it also led to a degree of stability, what we might refer to as the stability of stagnation. We did not embrace the extremes of politics that were happening in other parts of Europe in the 1930s. 
The political scientist Peter Mayer has often referred to the importance of this, the stability, the endurance of democracy through very difficult decades. It's not something that we should underestimate. We also have to be aware of the appetite that did exist, it seemed, in 1923 for bread and butter issues, for non-civil war politics. Even before that, in 1922, the impressive showing of the Labour Party in the June 1922 general election. The Irish Times announced that Labour had arrived as a force in national life as a result of its success in that general election. And yet they too were squeezed by the extremes of the civil war. Or consider the election in 1923 in Cavan. Two out of the four seats were filled by non Sinn Féin candidates, by non civil war sides, farmers and independents. In some respects, we recovered quickly. The Free State side indemnified itself against charges that might be brought arising from civil war. They ultimately pragmatically extended that to the other side, which helped. The army mutiny in its own way helped in 1924, one of the last gasps of the Civil War, establishing that the army would be answerable to the state, to the Department of Defence, as opposed to itself. And all of the blurring of lines between military and political life that had gone on throughout 1922 and 1923. And the period was a lottery for leadership. The what if inevitably around Michael Collins. We speak sometimes of Collins as if he inhabited a different ideological planet to his peers. Sometimes when I read the collected speeches of Michael Collins, they do not appear to me to be that different from the speeches of Eamon de Valere. Culturally, they were formed in the same way. But inevitably, arising out of the Civil War, arising out of the fallen, you do have the speculation as to what might have been different. Those blank canvases onto which you can paint whatever idealised image you like. And the self-serving utterances of Eamon de Valera during this period too. The convenience of asserting in relation to the Civil War that he was observing it as through a wall of glass, powerless to intervene effectively. That was only true to a certain degree. De Valera did not match his private doubts that I mentioned at the outset with his public assertions about the possibility of wading through the blood of Irishmen for these issues to be resolved. He was falling between different stools. He was not incorruptibly green enough for the militants within the anti-treaty IRA. But his alternative to the treaty was too far removed from the free state side to be remotely acceptable. And you can appreciate why he became the man they could not forgive because of the deep irony of him ultimately vindicating the interpretation of Michael Collins in relation to the stepping stone uh, thesis about the treaty, that it could be the stepping stone to greater freedom. And yet we have to be conscious of what we did achieve. There are those who've had civil wars more recent than ours, including in Spain. They engage in what they call the pact of forgetting. There are areas you don't go towards. There are spaces you leave sacred and untouched. I think we're more advanced than that 100 years on. We have, I hope, the maturity to face some of these very difficult questions. We need to start thinking about basic questions arising out of the period of execution. How do you prepare to go to your execution? How do you prepare to be the execution? What is involved in that? And how do those individuals carry it with them subsequently? And what do those who are executed mean to subsequent generations? What impacts does it have on their family? Or what impacts does it have on the way in which we characterize this civil war of ours from 1922 to 1923? And it is our civil war. And that's why we shouldn't forget. And that's why we should confront in as mature and honest a way as we can. Gurumila Magwif.